Okay, everybody, take your seats. Turn off your cell phones. And let's get started with floating point numbers. Let's get started with floating point numbers. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, now this will probably be reasonably new material for you. I think most of us don't have uh, a good understanding yet of floating point numbers, so we intend to teach it and teach it well here so that you can implement it in hardware. Um, I think most of what I've said before today was pretty much review and easy to understand. This will be more challenging, so please give your best attention. I know it's late in the afternoon, but if you can focus on this, you'll understand it better. Give your effort. So that means don't read your book from other classes, turn off your cell phone, your PDA, etc. Okay, great, thank you. All right, um, until now we've only dealt with integers, and obviously the world has got a lot of non-integer numbers. So we need a way to include very small and very large numbers. As you know, in base 10, we use something called scientific notation. What we need is something like that, but in base 2. Let's look at this number, negative 2.34. It has two extra digits of precision beyond the integer, and it can be raised to a power. The power in all of these is base 10, <coughs> but the power can be a positive or a negative integer, and the number itself is an integer portion combined with a fractional portion and can be negative or positive. Okay? So we have options for the sign of the integer in the uh, exponent and the sign of the uh, <coughs> non-exponent part can be positive or negative, and then we have an integer, and you, as you see, also a fractional part. Now, we call this a normalized number because this first digit is between 0 and 9. This is not normalized, sorry, between 1 and 9. This is not normalized, and this is not normalized because that needs to really be 9.8702 times 10 to the 11th, this really needs to be 2.0 times 10 to the minus 1. Everybody see that? Okay. All right. So, no, I'm sorry. 2.0 times 10 to the minus 7. Anyway, so this needs to be shifted over here, the decimal point. So the decimal point needs to be aligned for what we call normalized numbers. These are not normalized. Now, if we were to think in binary, then every number would look like this. Plus or minus, 1 point, the rest of the digits, the fractional part in base 2, multiplied by 2 to the some power. If you notice, very parallel to this. Plus or minus, a number in the range of what one digit Spasimak can be, right? One up to nine, in this case just one, because we don't have two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nocta, this is a decimal point, because this is base 10, so this will be called a binary point, because it's base two. These will be ones and zeros for the fractional part in base two, just like these are zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nines for the fractional part in base 10. Our Base is 2, so instead of 10, it's 2 raised to a power, and that power will be an integer number expressed by y. And when you have numbers like that, those are the machine representation of float and double and quad and all those nice high-precision uh, floating point number types that high-level languages offer. So if the high-level language offers you single precision floating point, double precision floating point, quad precision floating point, then the underlying uh, assembly language needs to support that as well. Now there's a standard for floating point numbers so that they're not all different. The standard for floating point numbers is defined by an IEEE standard number 754. That's a pretty famous standard number, IEEE 754. I'd like you to remember it. It is the standard for floating point numbers. It was developed in 1985 in response to a huge divergence of different approaches to handle floating point numbers. It was designed to bring them together in order to make uh, floating point numbers portable from one machine to another so that scientific code could run on this machine and then run on a faster machine and not have to rewrite all the uh, code because the number representations were different. Obviously, scientific code would include floating point numbers. Remember how we talked about the floating point code does a lot of math? It does it with floating point numbers, of course. Now, this standard is almost universally accepted. Almost nobody does it differently than the IEEE standard. That means it was an excellent standard, a really good way to represent floating point numbers. And we're going to learn that standard. We're going to learn how that's done because it stayed the same for the last 25 years. Right? So that's a good proof that it's not changing, but it's um, 
uh, stable standard. There's two main representations, 32-bit floating point numbers and 64-bit floating point numbers. We call these single precision and double precision numbers. There's a format given for how to represent floating point number in 32 bits and in 64 bits. We'll first do the single precision floating point numbers. Both standards involve a sign bit followed by an exponent followed by a fraction. <coughs> All these are, of course, going to just be ones and zeros, as you would expect since it's a binary number to be represented in the machine. Um, for the single precision standard, uh, the exponent will be an 8-bit exponent, and the fraction will be a 23-bit number. So 23 plus 8 plus 1 makes 32 bits. For the double precision standard, after the sign bit, we'll have 11 bits of exponent and 52 bits of fraction, making a grand total of 64 bits. Okay? Now here's how the value of the number is calculated. Minus 1 raised to the sign bit power. So if the sign bit is 0, any number raised to the 0th power, of course, is 1. So it becomes 1 times this, and it becomes a positive number. On the other hand, if the sign bit is 1, minus 1 raised to the power 1 is minus 1, so it becomes a negative number. So an S of 1 means it's a negative number. An S of 0 means it's a positive number. Well, how about that? In our most significant bit position, which we often call the sign position, if it's 0, it's non-negative. If it's 1, it's negative. Hey, that fits with all the other things we've been doing all along anyway. Okay. Integers are also represented that way if they're signed to as complement integers. Let's continue. The fraction is only going to be the part which is added to 1. It doesn't include the 1. And that's because all fractions begin with 1 and then the binary point. So we only need to store the part that can change. This can't change. So we don't store that, but obviously 1 plus that is the value of the number. Okay, so 1 plus that is the value of the number. So that's what it says here. 1 plus the fraction raised to what power? Okay, the, the answer is raised to 2 to the exponent, that's right here, minus the bias. Now this exponent can be positive or negative. If it's a negative number, I'm going to, therefore, 2 to the negative large can give us a very tiny, tiny, tiny fraction. If it's a positive number, it can give us a very, very, very big number. So the wonderful thing about this is 10 to the 23rd and 10 to the minus 23rd represent extreme ranges of numbers. This is an extremely tiny quantity. This is an extremely enormous quantity. And all I did, as you can see, is just change the exponent of the, of the sign in the, um, the sign of the exponent. OK, so now the bias needs to be explained. I'll get to that in just a minute. You might say, oh, it should just be 2 to the exponent. There's a reason for the bias which needs to be subtracted out. And I'll, I'll deal with that in just a second. So the sign bit tells us if our number is negative or non-negative. The significant is always normalized so that it looks like one point followed by the fractional part. And it's the fractional part that we store here. And obviously, the significant with the one on it has to fall in this range. It can't be greater than two. It has to be one or greater. It always has a leading pre-binary point one, so we don't bother to store it because that's always on it. So we just add it back in when we're doing the calculation. Uh, the significant is the fraction with the one and the binary point restored. So this by itself is not the significant, but this is the significant. Okay. All right. Now the exponent is using a representation called excess representation. For the single precision, it's excess 127. So you have to subtract out the bias of 127. For um, double precision, it's excess 1,023. So you subtract out the bias of 1,023. Why excess notation? You'll have to wait. I'll show that to you in just a minute. OK, it ensures that the exponent is unsigned. So because of uh, this, I'll always have a positive number here for my exponent. Um, and that means I can use the full range from uh, 0 up to uh, in this case, 255. In this case, one, what is it, 2047. All right, so therefore, in the single precision range of numbers, using this with 8 and 23, we're going to reserve the exponents 8 zeros and 8 ones for special purposes. So that means out of the 256 possible exponents, 
254 are valid for the reasons we're going to show, and two of them are reserved. So we'll never have an exponent of all zeros or never have an exponent of all ones. Okay? So those are set aside. The smallest value will therefore be with exponent 1, and the largest value is going to obviously be with exponent 254. 255 and 0 are taken out. Okay? Now, with exponent 1, we subtract out the bias, and we end up with a value of negative 126. So 2 to the negative 126th power is our tiniest, tiniest number. Okay? And so our fraction can be all zeros. So when we put that with the significant of 1, 1 1.0 times 2 to the negative 126th power um, is the smallest possible number that can be represented. I can have the sine bit be positive or negative. It doesn't really matter. These are, as you can imagine, extremely close to 0. So if here's my zero value, the smallest negative number and smallest positive number are these. And then we'll also examine what are my largest negative and largest positive. Notice it's not an infinite number line. In fact, I can exactly tell you how many values can be represented and how many values, well, I can't answer that question. I can tell you how many values can be represented. That's how many values can be represented in single precision. That's how many values can we represent. I can't represent this value. That one's in, that one's in, the ones in between are not in. Oh, but it's floating point, sir. doesn't matter. I have a finite number of values that can be represented by 32 bits. And I stretched them out over the number line, but not equally. Obviously, I have them very close and yawned down here and very far apart out here at the ends. They're not equally spaced. The big numbers are very far from each other. The small numbers are very close to each other. But the total number of floating point numbers is this if I have 32 bits and this if I have 64 bits, isn't it? Yeah, that's just the law of finite fields, finite register widths. Okay, so uh, these are my minimum values and if you convert it to base 10 it's something like this. 1.2 times 10 to the minus 38th. If you are got a physics roommate or you have a physics hobby or you know anybody that's in physics, they'll tell you that number might not be small enough for some of the things that need to be represented, okay? Might not be small enough, like the beginning of the Big Bang, what happened in the first little instant. They, they want to talk about instants smaller than that, I'm pretty sure, okay? So that's not quite the smallest number that needs to be used to discuss the physical world we live in. Now, how about largest value? Okay, well, if we take the largest exponent here, 254, we subtract the bias out of it, we get positive 127. So we know that our largest fraction is 1111111, so the significant becomes 1.1111111, we might as well call that 2. Basically, we can round that and call that 2. So our largest number is more or less 2.0 multiplied by 2 to the 127th power, and that one can be put as 3.4 times 10 to the 38th. Notice, just what we'd kind of expect. And I promise you, the physics people will say, no, 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 that's way too small. We've got bigger things than 10 to the 38th power, much bigger. Talk about the universe, talk a number of atoms in the universe. That, that's not going to get the job done. So that's why double precision can represent more numbers closer together here, further out on the extremes, and allow us to have bigger numbers and smaller numbers. So we can get even closer to zero and even closer to infinity. But of course, we still have a fixed number of values. Right. A fixed number of values. You're not going to get an infinite number of reals out of 64 bits. I hope that's in incredibly obvious. Can't get an infinite number of real numbers. Even though the real number line is an infinite number of reals, you can't represent them all. You cannot. Well, how about a thousand bits, sir? No. How about a million bits, sir? No, it doesn't matter how many bits you have. You cannot represent every real number because there's an infinite number of real numbers. And two to the n, no matter what n is, doesn't equal infinity. So therefore, it's a useless task. Don't worry about it. You can't do it. But we might want bigger numbers and smaller numbers. And so double precision allows us to do that. The MIPS format for double precision is a sign bit, an 11-bit exponent, and 52 bits of mantissa. And so the formula is as it was before, like this, uh, 2 to the exponent minus the bias. Now our bias is 1,023. So that's what we'll subtract out. So here we go again. Our smallest exponent of 11 zeros and our biggest exponent of 11 ones are reserved. Take them out. So what we're left with is 
Our smallest exponent of 1, 1 minus 1,023 is negative 1,022. So our smallest number is therefore 1.0, a fraction of all zeros, times 2 to the negative 1,022. And that's about this. And I think that's pretty small. I think the physics people would say, yeah, 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 Tara. We busy, 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 guru. You know, negative 10 to the negative 308th power. That's, I think, sufficiently small. Maybe in another 100 years, they might find need for smaller than that. But right now, I think that's pretty good. And the largest value, again, is this, which is 2046. When you subtract the bias from it, you get positive 1023. Notice very close there. So when you make the largest fraction of all ones, you essentially get you know, this again. So it's basically 2.0 plus or minus times 2 to the 1023rd power, which is about 1.8 times 10 to the 308th. And again, I think that's plenty big. I can't think of anything I've ever read across, come across that needs a power of 10 greater than 308, or a power of 2, therefore, greater than 1,000. So those are the largest and smallest numbers of the single precision and double precision uh, representation systems. Are there any questions about what I've just showed you here? How to find largest, how to find smallest? You might possibly be curious, why did we reserve two of the exponents and not let them be used for normal number calculation? Maybe you weren't curious, but I'm going to encourage you to be curious about everything in your life. Curious people learn more. The people who say, oh, get you, get you, you know, namely Dale Bonane, uh, don't learn as much. So when you're curious about why is that like that, if that comes up from you naturally, you can make a good scientist and a good engineer because you want to say why, and if you're not happy with the answer, you want to make a better answer. And so you're a solution finder, you're a solution provider, but it begins with curiosity as to why is it the way it is. I'm not ready to answer that quite yet, but I will in just a minute. Did you have a question? Why do we use uh, bias? There's another why, okay. All right. Why do we use bias? Okay, um, if you noticed, the exponents come out to always be positive integers. The smallest one is 1, the biggest one, and then after we subtract the bias, we get into the negatives. But the, the value itself stored in the uh, field is going to be a positive number. After I subtract the bias, my result can be, for my exponent, a negative or a positive number. Is there any value in not letting this be negative? There is. The value in not letting it be negative will be soon be shown, but the reason we do the biasing is to ensure that these exponents are all unsigned integers, don't need any negative integers. And yet we need to be able to get a negative result in the end, so as you saw here in the things, taking a small one and subtracting the bias puts me in the negative range, so I can represent the ones that are very close to zero without having to use negative numbers here. That's the reason. Now, why is it that that's an advantage? You'll see in just a minute. You'll see in just a minute. Okay. All right. Now, let's go a little bit deeper. Any other questions about the, uh, the min value, max value, how we're calculating these numbers? Okay. Let me ask you a question then. How did you get from here to here? And why should anybody believe that? How is that to that converted? How do you convert a base 10 number to a base 2 number? How do you convert a base 2 number to a base 10 number? Yeah? Uh, two, 2 to the power 10 is uh, likely uh, equal uh, 10 to 3. OK. That's pretty Kaba. Let's have a look here. This is uh, 1,024. This is exactly 1,000. So your error percentage is 2.5%. Kabaja, I'll accept that, but that's 2.5% error. All right. um, can we do any better than that? How about this one? 10 to the n equals 2 to the what? Well, no, too big, too small. Too big. Three point. Do we know that number? Do we know that number? What is that number? Three point what? Three point one. No, 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 no. One six. Where'd that come from? Yeah. Pardon? Yes, it is, isn't it? The log to the base two of ten equals exactly that. 
doesn't it? Ah, yeah, now I have a way to convert n times this equals n times that, right? So therefore, oh, I'm sorry, if this is n, then this needs to be n times. That's what I meant to put. If this is 1, then it's that. If this is n, then it's n times that. Ah, now I got a way to convert from this to this, and these stay the same. The only problem is, if this happens to be 4, I can't write 4 over here because it has to be a base 2 number, doesn't it? Ah, so convert this part over to that, convert this part over to that, and I can do it. Now that's just basic math knowledge. Nobody should walk into college without knowing that stuff. The relation between base 2 and base 10 is logarithmically determined. Thank you very much for that answer. But that's something all of you can do. This is not 2.5% error. Yuck, let's shake. Let, no, 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 no. This is converted exactly, OK? Now, let's go on. Um, 754, floating point standard encoding. How do we encode, OK? For single precision, where I have an 8-bit exponent and a 23-bit um, F field, fractional field, or for double precision, where I have 11-point exponent and 52-bit fractional field, this exponent of all zeros, eight of them, or this exponent of 11 zeros is reserved. We already said that it's reserved. But I want you to notice that it has two different meanings. If these are all zeros and my fractional part is zero, it means the number is truly zero. If these are all zeros and my fractional part is non-zero, then it means it's a denormalized number. A denormalized number. Well, if you know what a normalized number is, then you know a denormalized number means it hasn't been normalized. It's outside the range of normalized numbers. If you don't know what a normalized number is, that doesn't mean anything to you. Raise your hand if you know what a normalized number is. Okay? All the normalized numbers in base 2 are going to look like this. One point, and then a whole bunch of zeros and ones. Th that's a normalized number in base 2. Won't look like anything else. Oh, but sir, but what if it's that? It's not normalized. Sir, but what if it's that? Not normalized. Sir, but what if it's... It's not normalized, okay? Now, how do we normalize that number? That's the number, but it's not normalized. How do I normalize it? 1.0 times 2 to the minus 7th, right? Same thing. That's now normalized number. That's not a normalized number. Okay, so what happens if I have this? 1.0 times 2 to the minus max. What do we call that? What's that? That's the smallest thing that we can represent, isn't it? And what if I need something smaller than that? Yeah, no, same precision. What if I want to have... Huh. That's denormalized, isn't it? But it means it's a little closer to zero, doesn't it? Just a little bit closer to zero. And that's a little closer, and that's a little closer, and that's even a little closer, and that's really, really close. Ah, okay. Do you see where denormalized numbers can come? They can help you get even, even closer to the origin here. So now what I've got here with these two is true zero can be represented, and numbers very, very close to it can be represented. Because before what we had was the following problem. We have here and here my min positive and my min negative. And guess what? There's a lot of mileage between there and true zero. And we didn't even have a way to represent zero. You remember? We have that range and we have that range. We don't do here. Well, come on. Who can have a number system without a zero? Oh, well, sir, that's easy. I know how to represent zero. You just go 0.0. .0. .0. Is that a normalized number? No. OK, now it's normalized. How do you represent zero when it starts with, uh, you can't do it. Zero cannot start like that, and yet we're insisting. So that's why zero is a special case. And that's why the denormalized numbers are special cases. The denormalized numbers allow me to gracefully come down in closer and closer to zero from my representation of my minimum numbers, positive and negative. OK, now. For all the other exponents between here and here, those are just 
regular floating point numbers. We showed how to convert all these. In this range from this one to this one, including that special one and that one, those are just, no matter what this is, those are plus and minus floating point numbers. No problem. We, we know how to convert those according to the formula. I've already showed that. Anybody have any questions about what to do here? Now we come to the other exception. The highest exponent, which is all ones. In single, it's 8. And in double precision, it's 11. What do we do with those? Well, the answer is we can do two things with them. If the fractional part is all zeros, we let it represent infinity, positive or negative infinity. Why is it useful to have a representation for infinity? Why is it useful to have a representation for infinity? Well, here's my negative max, and I want to go further. What shall I say? Error, stop the calculation, can't do it. You know, this is already 10 to the, what kind of numbers do we have? 308th power or 10 to the 38th, right? It's already really big, but if you want to go bigger, there is one thing that's actually quite useful in math is to consider infinity as the value. Bigger than your biggest, okay? So that's a useful thing to do in math sometimes, to have a representation for infinity. Maybe not quite as useful as having a representation for zero. That's critical, but it's useful. And then the last category is all ones but non-zero. What does that mean? That means that you're representing something that's not a number. You're representing something that's not a number. For example, I'll give you an example here. I did a divided by b, and I want to get the result. The only problem is a and b are both infinity. Or maybe I did a multiplied by b. That should work just great, except when a is 0 and b is infinity. And now I don't know what the answer is, and I can't calculate it. So we have a way to tell that you did one of those kind of weird things without stopping the calculation. You represent it as not a number, and you keep on rolling. At the end, you can examine it. Of course, with the special code, you'll know that you've got a zero, or a denormalized, or infinity, one of your two infinities, positive or negative, or not a number. You'll know because of the code. The code is a special code. So very clever system, very clever system, very well designed in order to allow computers to do math with extremely big, extremely little numbers and some weird special cases that didn't fit very well, like that and those and the infinities and weird stuff like that. Okay? Any questions? All right, this is the standard. It's how it's represented. Your code needs to obey this in order for it to work with the standard. Okay, so... Um, all fraction bits are significant. Um, with uh, single precision, the least significant bit is 2 to the minus 23rd. And so that gives you roughly six decimal digits of precision. In uh, double precision, the least significant bit is 2 to the 52nd. In other words, you understand what I'm saying? If here's my f, and it's all zeros, and I get all the way down to here, what's that value? Well, it's 2 to the 23rd or 2 to the 52nd, negative 52nd or negative 23rd, and that's approximately 16 decimal digits of precision. Can anybody tell me why <coughs> 23 turns into 6 and why 52 turns into 16? <coughs> this again, right? Base 10 digits and base 2 digits are roughly 3.16 in relationship to one another. Roughly. Okay. So for every base 10 digit, there's roughly three and some change extra base two digits. All right. Um, now, let's start going through some examples. What floating point number is represented by the single floating, floating point value? One, one, <coughs> six zeros, another one, a zero, one, and all the rest zeros. This is a single precision value. So how many numbers are there here? 32, so all the ones that aren't shown are here and they're all zeros. Okay, do you see the color code? That's my sign bit, that's my exponent bit, bits, those are my fractional bits. All right, let's translate this into a number. S is 1. Is this a positive number or a negative number? Negative number, okay. The fraction is 01, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay, so there's my fraction, and that's, of course, a base 2 number. My exponent is 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 
<coughs> which happens to be 129. That by itself is 128. When I put one more on, it's 129. How did I know that's 128? Because with 8, I can get all the way up to 255. So therefore, you know, the value of this is 2 to the 7th, or 127, and then one more. So 128 plus one more, 129. When I subtract the bias out of that, I'm going to get a 2. So it's going to be 2 to the 2nd power. When I stick on my 1 to this, I'm going to have 1.01. .01. So my number is 1.01 .01 base 2 times 2 to the 2nd power, negative. Okay, everybody can see this. I'm going to clear out the junk and isolate that so we can all see. Where'd this 2 come from? 129 minus 127. Where'd the 127 come? It's the bias. Where'd the 129 come? It's this green number here. We all see how we calculated 2 to the second power? Hope so. Okay. All right, how'd we get this? 1.01. .01. Well, this is standard. You always get that. The 01 is the leading digits of this. I don't need to write all the rest of the zeros. Okay. All right, let's, let's analyze this number right here. 1.01 .01 in base 2. What does that mean? 2 to the what power is this? Zero. 2 to the 0th power. What about this? What power is this? Minus 2 to the minus 1st power. What power is this? Minus 2 to the minus 2nd. 2 to the minus 2nd, we all know, is 1 4th. 0.25. So this is 1.25 in base 10 times 4, which is 5. So the number is negative 5. Any questions on how we did that? Let's do another one. Okay, um, let's take a four-digit decimal number, okay, um, and it's gonna, we're going to add together um, these, two, these two numbers. 9.999 times 10 to the first, 1.610 times 10 to the minus first. Now, everybody I think recognizes that if I add this to this, I've made a huge mistake because they don't both have the same power of 10. So the first thing to do is to align them so that they're lined up correctly because this 9 doesn't represent the same power of 10 that this 1 does. What power of 10 does this 9 represent? 10 to the first. What power of 10 does this 1 represent? 10 to the minus first. They're different by two place values. So it would be foolish to line them up and say, oh, 1 adds with 9, 6 adds with 9. You know, that would be wrong. Okay. So we've to, uh, the first thing we have to do is align the decimal points. And in base 2, we're going to align the binary points. We must shift values first so that we can add Basimach values, which are of equal weight, of equal value. Right? Did we all agree about that? Anybody have questions about that? OK. So that means we're going to either have to change this one into 10 to the minus first, which is going to be shifting this one that way, or we're going to have to change this one into 10 to the first, which is going to mean shifting this one that way, one or the other. OK, we're going to shift the number with the smaller exponent. So this one has the smaller exponent. So we're going to take that one and turn it into 10 to the first by shifting it this way. So it becomes 0 0.016 times 10 to the first. We denormalized it. We denormalized it in order to do the addition. Now, since this is 10 to the first, and this is 10 to the first, I hope everybody will agree that adding this plus this gives an answer which is raised to the power 10 to the first. And that's OK to do. Does everybody understand that? OK, so now that I've aligned them, I can actually do the addition. So now I add the significands. That part's called the significand. I add the significands. 9.999 times 10 to the first plus 0 0.016 times 10 to the first is 10.015 times 10 to the first. Is that my final answer? What's wrong with that answer? It's denormalized. Yes, it is denormalized. So what I'm going to do is I've got to normalize my result. In this case, I can see I'm going to have to shift it this way and add 1 to this. So it becomes 1.0015 times 10 to the second power. Every time you shift you add left to the right, you add. Every time you shift to the left, you have to subtract from the exponent. OK, now the problem is I started out with three digits of precision, three digits of precision. I ended up with four digits of precision. And I might not be able to hold that four digits of precision. You say, hold you. I've got as much paper or board space as I need. And if I run out, I'll go to the next classroom and keep on writing. Yeah, you do in the physical world. But in the computer world, you have a fixed number of bits. 
So therefore, you cannot hold extra least significant places. You have to round. So we must do a rounding algorithm. So if we round this to 1.002 times 10 to the second, we're done. There's only one problem with rounding. Watch this one. 1.996. And I'm only allowed two digits of precision. What happens when I round? Oh. Yeah, it's going to affect things. What if this was a 9? Now what happens? Oops, rounding caused it to be denormalized, didn't it? Rounding that is going to cause 10.00. That's nice and rounded, but it's denormalized. So it says round and renormalize if necessary. Sometimes when you round, you denormalize it because it carried over and bumped it out of the normalized form. Do we understand that? Yeah, OK. It didn't happen here, but I found an example where it did happen here in base 10. I promise you it can happen in base 2 also. OK, now let's do a floating point addition in base 2. Same principles, same idea. We're going to go through it step by step just to make sure that we understand. I have a four-digit binary example. This base 2 number has three digits of precision. This base 2 number has three digits of precision. It appears that I'm adding, but this is negative. This one's positive. Um, and this was 2 to the minus first. And this one's 2 to the minus second. They don't have the same uh, uh, value in their exponent. So this turns out to be 0.5. Everybody see? 1 times 1 half is 0.5. This turns out to be 0.4375. When you add those together, you can see I'm going to get a slightly positive number. OK, let's go ahead and do it. So the first thing is we have to align the binary points. They're not the same. We take the one with the smallest exponent, and we promote it to this, which is one place value higher, that means this is going to have to shift one place value to the right. So it becomes, this is the same, this one becomes negative 0.111 times 2 to the first. Now the two have been aligned. Now I can do the addition of the significance, 1.000 and negative 0.111 when added together uh, equal 0 0.001 base 2 times 2 to the minus first. Is this a normalized number? Definitely not a normalized number. So we've got to renormalize it. We normalize the result, and then we check for underflow and overflow. We didn't mention that before. What are underflow and overflow? What are underflow and overflow? What's overflow? Holding up my arms, what's overflow? Too big negative to be contained in the number of bits, or too big positive to be contained in the number of bits. What do you think underflow is, therefore? too small to be contained in the number of bits. In other words, have to go to a denormalized number if you, if you have them. Okay, So underflow means it can't be represented. Overflow means it can't be represented. How would you know if it couldn't be represented? You'd look at your integer and see if it was at the max end or at the min end, right? Yeah, OK. All right, so we normalize it. 1.000 from this becomes 2 to the minus fourth. There wasn't any underflow or overflow. Don't need to round it. Stays the same. There's our answer, no change. And that turns out to be 1 times 2 to the minus 4th is 1 16th. If you know your fractions, 1 16th is 0 0.0625. And that's the difference between this and this. So we get the correct answer. Any questions about doing base 2 floating point addition or subtraction? Any questions? OK. I'm going to, of course, after I teach it, expect you to be able to do it. So if you don't understand it, it's a good time to ask questions. Otherwise, there'll be an expectation that you think is unfair, but I think is very fair. Because after teaching and saying, do you understand it, if you say quiet, oh, yeah, I understand it, sure, then now it's your job to be able to do it. If you say, no, you didn't explain it well, I don't understand it, great, then my job is to teach better. But if you stay quiet at the crucial question, do you understand this, and there's no sound, then I'm transferring responsibility for it over to you now. Okay. Can you do this? Do you understand what's being done here? I hope so. It's not rocket science. OK, let's go on. Now, we need some hardware to be able to do this in the machine. We're not going to do this step by step. It's too slow. We need hardware to do it fast. So what are we talking about here? Floating point addition hardware. We've done little floating point examples. You see what has to happen. What has to happen? Denormalizing so the exponents are the same. Addition of the significance, then renormalizing, 
then rounding, and if necessary, renormalizing again. And all the time there's a risk of underflow and overflow. Yeah. All right, so we need an algorithm then that's going to take that into account. It's much more complex than integer addition. Doing it in one clock cycle would make a very long clock cycle. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a floating point adder, which is multi-clock cycle. That way the clock cycle can stay very fast. If we slow down the clock cycle for this to get it done in one clock cycle, it'll slow every instruction down. We don't want to do that. We want to make the common case fast. It's not the common case. So therefore, floating point adders are usually multi-cycle, but we can pipeline them, and therefore the several cycles will still be done efficiently. We can get one result per clock cycle because we pipelined. You know what pipelining means? Taking a big job, chopping it into pieces, and pushing the pieces in R to shill so that the pieces pop out one per clock cycle. So you get a result every clock cycle. All right, here's the hardware. Whoa, oh my goodness. Here's the hardware uh, for floating point addition. Let's see what's going on here. Sine exponent fraction, that's one of my numbers. Sine exponent fraction, that's my other number. I start with two numbers in floating point format. When I'm done, I get the sum in floating point format, or the difference. Okay, so that's great. What are we doing here? We're flowing through some hardware. Let's see what happens. This exponent and this exponent go to a little ALU that figures out who is the smallest exponent. Why do I want to know who is the smallest exponent? Yeah, because I've got to denormalize that one in order to make them the same. So I figure out who the smallest exponent is, subtracting, get the difference, and I know which one is, and I know how many they're different by. And then, of course, that's going to go to a control unit, which is going to cause some change in the exponent and some shifting in the uh, value. And so sure enough, that sends it over to a shift right thing here. This is a multiplexer. That's the zero ngth input. That's the beer ngth input. It's a two input, one output multiplexer symbol. So is this. What's it choosing between? Oh, that fraction and this fraction. It's choosing one of them to do a shift on. Which one will it do the shift on? The one that had the smallest exponent. Right. It'll shift it this number of bits. And then it'll say, great, now that I've got you where I want, we'll take the other one, which was the big one, and we'll send them into the big ALU. The little ALU does a subtraction on the exponents. The big ALU is going to do what? Addition if we're adding or subtraction if we're subtracting of the now adjusted mantissa values or significant values. That's right. It's going to actually add, it doesn't show it, but it's going to add the one point. Yanni. Right here. One point that and one point that. So we bring that. Now we got what we want to add and we add it, right? Okay. Let's go on. <coughs> Coming out of the big ALU, I send that value here for control in order to know something about it. The control unit's the brain of this whole thing. Um, but I also send the result into another multiplexer, into which is also sent. Uh, this value here, the round, after the rounding hardware, so I'm either going to take this one or I'm going to take it after rounding, and I'm going to shift to the left or the right. What am I doing there? Re I'm renormalizing, exactly. Shifting to the left or the right in order to renormalize. And when I renormalize, I also have to increment or decrement the exponent as well, don't I? Yeah, you don't just shift the mantissa left or right. You also, as you shift left, change, or shift right, you change. So here we're incrementing or decrementing the exponent. Here we're shifting right or left the fractional value. And look, we're almost done. Now that we got that, we look at those and we say, oh, now we apply the rounding algorithm. So there's some algorithm here in hardware to do rounding. And then popping out of that is the fractional part and the exponent part. Can rounding change the exponent? Yeah, I showed an example right there. Rounding could change the exponent, sure. So it can change both parts. And if it's denormalized, then we go back around and do the loop again. Okay? All right? But if not, we're done. And that goes here, and that goes here, and the sine bit comes here, and we got our final result. Okay? The stages are compare the exponents. Shift the smaller number to the left or the right till they're aligned by denormalizing one. Add them together. Now normalize them and round. And if that denormalized it, go back and do it. Okay, that's, that's our algorithm until we're done. And the result comes here. All right. That, my friends, is doing some pretty sophisticated work in hardware. I don't know if you can tell that. Now this 
obviously, is control and data path. It's a smart algorithm. It's got some, this thing is telling various multiplexers what they should do and so on. But you can clearly see that the design principles of CS223 separating out the task into control, which needs an algorithm. We're not showing that yet, but at least has to do those things. And data path is then here for you. OK, I'm going to let you go now. This is kind of the high point of the lecture is to show how you can do floating point addition in hardware. OK, have a nice afternoon.